Hello and welcome to The Shift, the podcast that aims to tell the no-holds-barred truth about being a woman post-40. Created and hosted by me, journalist and author Sam Baker. My guest today is the whirlwind also known as Kathy Latt. Australian Kathy smashed her way into the global bestseller list at the age of 17 with the novel Puberty Blues. Since then, she's turned her irreverent pen on the peaks and troughs, triumphs and total BS of the female existence. I first read her with Girls Night Out and the Llama Parlour in my 20s, and I met Kathy when I was featured editor of New Woman. Remember that? Yet another resident of the magazine Graveyard. Fetal Attraction and Mad Cow followed, which was made into a film starring Anna Friel and Joanna Lumley. 20 books later, her latest, The Revenge Club, takes hilarious aim at the way women are scrap heaped, sometimes professionally, sometimes personally, sometimes both, in their 50s. The chief time women initiate the divorce is when the husband retires because we want, di- we want different things. But just as our estrogen goes down and our testosterone comes up, with men, the opposite happens. Their testosterone drops and their estrogen comes up. So when a man retires, generally speaking, he wants to stay at home and nest. Mm. Kathy joined me to talk about why life is in two acts and the key is surviving the perimenopausal interval, reaping the benefits of the invisibility cloak and chipping away at ageing double standards. She also told me about being told off by her teenage daughter, the power of complaining, why divorce isn't to be feared and why her midlife mantra is, if it doesn't spark joy, It's time to toss it away. So what's happened in your life? (laughs) Oh, God, how long have you got? That would take forever. Do you say you were looking for a cardigan? You've got like a great big jumper on. It's freezing cold, you crazy. What, you English people, you think this is pro- positively balmy. But haven't you got the, yeah, totally. Well, I'm in Scotland, so I really think it's balmy. <laughs> but, You're in sunny. Look at the sun on your hair. Yeah, it's lovely. Oh, nice. My hands are so cold. I'm trying to Oh, my God, you need, like, fingerless mitts. So you haven't got the kind of, your body's temp- core temperature didn't soar five degrees in menopause then. Yeah, but I'm through the other side. Yeah. I'm on HRT, so. Yeah, heaven. no, me too, but it's completely, I've gone from being a permanently freezing person to being a permanently boiling person. That's because you're a smoking hot mama. <laughs> no, I love a jumper, me. I miss them. <laughs> Do you? <laughs> yeah. I think we last had a chat at that whistle, was it a whistles thing? Oh, Remember yeah. there was a whistles yeah. kind of, whistles penguin salon thing. Oh my God, it was so long ago. Yeah, and we got free frocks. Babe, you did. I did. I got you got a free frock. <laughs> I'm like, I suppose a frock would be out of the question. <laughs> oh, it's because you're such a clothes horse. That's true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's like, it's no wonder, is it, that women are a bit freaked out by ageing, younger women, because it's like, look at the double standards. Oh, and, and of course, the, 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 the double standards are sewn into our psyche and our vernacular. So... You know, a man our age, silver fox, while we are old hags, crags, mm. old bags, crones. And, you know, there's a line in the book where she says something about you never hear a man dismissed as mutton dressed as ram. No, and, and never. You really, I mean, you, know, they can, you see them walking down the beach with their budgie smugglers on, huge fat, <laughs> sweaty belly, and they're walking along like they're God's gift. And they have no idea. <laughs> How, how disgusting they look. And yet they'll be the first ones to judge an older woman wearing a bikini, for example. There's all these rules that we can't – it's like who are these fashion fashionistas who tell us that we can't wear short skirts? You know, and my, my legs are what I've got left, for God's sake. Can't wear short skirts. Yeah. Can't bear my arms, my upper arms. But what about the woman's right to bear arms? Like it should yeah. be enough on Confucius. And I'm not allowed to show my decolletage in case there's a wrinkle. Oh, because it's crepey. Crepey? I'm like, who makes these rules up and why do we adhere to them? Yeah, I've got no idea where they came from. It's like um, when I interviewed Delia Efron, she said the same thing about her legs. She said, my legs are all I've got left. 
Now, Did I, am you say not, that? Oh. I am not putting them away for anyone. Oh, no. no. and I, I remember when I, when my daughter, I wrote a book called To Love, Honour and Betray about the teenage daughter-mother relationship, which is so tricky because I think, you know, girls get taken hostage by their hormones at about mm. 17. They come out the other side. Have you got a daughter? Have you got daughters? No, no, I don't. Well, they come out the other side at about 20, you know, they, they return to you. But I think they have to sort of define themselves by breaking away from their mothers, which means they're very cruel. And it's like living with the Taliban, not allowed to laugh, <laughs> sing, dance, wear short skirts. And I remember I was going out one day and I had a really short pink leopard skin knee skirt on and I knew my daughter wouldn't approve. She was about 13. So I, I crept down to the front door. I was like, <laughs> open the door. I was surprised she, she didn't go out the back window. <laughs> I know, right? She heard me and she's like him running after me she goes what are you wearing go back to your room you're not going out dressed like that I'm saying to her, but surely my legs are okay I can still wear a short skirt she said it's not the legs mum the skirt doesn't go with your face <gasps> so brutal with low self-esteem is hereditary you get it from your teenage daughters but I, I, oh I did God. in that book I wrote a fantastic survival tip for any any mother who's raising a teenage daughter and she next time she hits you and kicks you and says, I wish you'd just die, you know, take a big drag on a cigarette and a big gulp of wine and say, I'm doing my best, darling. <laughs> How old's your daughter now? Were you menopausal, oh, she- perimenopausal when she was in puberty? Yeah, and that's another that's another oh, terrible no. thing about going through the menopause because we have our cho- tend to have our children later, just as uh, your hormones are leaving the building. Her hormones. Mm. You can imagine the, the the tsunami of emotion going on. is is really so hard. It's like it makes white water rafting look like <laughs> a paddle in the park. So yeah, that that is really really tricky. But yeah, that, but as I said, she's she's they do come out the other side. She's the most wonderful woman now. We're really good friends. She's thirty one. Um, she's a human rights lawyer. She's works for Reprieve. She's she's fabulous. So there is hope. <laughs> yeah. And she's a great feminist. So, you know, I'm very I mean, I think actually I just think any mother who gets her kid to sixteen and they're not voting Tory, um, or collecting Nazi memorabilia, <laughs> mothering medal. Hello. You've done well there. <laughs> so what was why did you decide to take on ageism in this, in the Revenge well, Club? First of all, I do think ageist sexism is the last great mm. fight for feminists. You know, we've, at my generation has done so much to take the stigma out of menopause. Um, and I do think for women, life is in two acts. I think the trick is mm. surviving the interval, which is the menopause, which is yeah. terrible, where you sweat more than Donald Trump doing a Sudoku. I do think that. <laughs> sorry, that's re- that's a really good one. Um, <laughs> okay, I'll go. Thanks, Sam. I mean, it's like that's such a good way of looking at it. I think because it's almost like you've got, say, the first act, and then the kind of received wisdom is that you stop at the interval. Okay. If you're a woman, that's it. You go into the interval. You never come out. It's like, yeah. <laughs> and of course, in reality, the postmenopause is the best time of a woman's life. And yeah. just when you're feeling at the peak of your productivity, when you can finally cut the psychological umbilical cord that's kept you tethered to the kitchen by your heart and your apron strings, mm. just at that moment, society puts you out to pasture. You're deemed to a pasture amuse by date. So it's it's infuriating. And if you think of the most powerful women in the world right now on the world stage, they're all postmenopausal, you know. Mm. Even in the in the rock industry, you know, Kylie, Madonna, how old's Beyonce? She's probably she must be she's very forty old. odd. Yeah. So it's like you just because you why I think why I why I say to women, you know, the best time of your life is to come, is that the good thing that happens after the menopause because we're brought women are brought up to be decorative and demure. Mm. We are all the research shows that when a man and woman start talking at the same time, the woman always pulls back. We're we're far too yeah. nice. But after the menopause, when your estrogen drops a bit, that caring, sharing hormone, and your testosterone comes up a little bit, you get a little bit more bolshy, a little bit more selfish, a little bit more like a bloke, actually, and you can put yourself first for the first time in your life. 
and you no longer care what people think. You get a kind of you get a kind of oh fuck it, I'm fifty G and it kicks in at fifty. Mm. But it's even more so over sixty. I mean, I don't even call it sixty. I call it sexy because yeah. also you're in your sexual prime. I think because you're. I mean, I do take HRT, which keeps me, you know, hot to trot and juicy. I mean, I can't believe I'm even vertical right now talking to you. Yeah. <laughs> your, your good sex is about feeling relaxed in your skin, and at this yeah. age, of course, you're relaxed. You, you know, you can't going to carpe the hell out of DM if not now when. And you've got a sense of humour about everything. So I think it's the best. I think it's the most liberating time of your life. So there's a lot to look forward to, but we just have to get let make society abandon this idea that we are surplus to requirements. And it's not just me imagining this. About two years ago, MI5 said they wanted to recruit middle-aged women because nobody sees us. Yeah, because they're the most invisible. So. They wanted us to be yeah. spies. And I think if, if society is going to give us the cloak of invisibility, are we going to use it for good or for evil? And, and I, I'm thinking evil. Totally evil, yeah. Why not? Got a lot of making up to do. Uh, yeah, I, th- I think revenge is a totally underrated coping mechanism. <laughs> so was there a little bit of revenge for you in yes. writing the book? Well, I had this own crisis myself because, I, I mean, I've written, I've written 19 books, you know, a lot of them bestsellers. Mm. I was published in 19 languages around the world. Then I took this idea to my publisher about four women, you know, four old friends taking revenge on the men who were sabotaging their careers for the, for the because of the crime of being a hot menopausal mess. And I took it to my agent, who was pale male stale, and he was like, "Oh, nobody wants to read about middle aged women; they're just not sex." Oh, and then my publisher, do one. <laughs> then, then my publisher dropped me after all this time, and I was like. I really had a crisis of confidence. I thought maybe I maybe I have passed my news by date. God, so what I were they like, Kathy? I'm just gonna we'll we'll pass on this one, Kathy. Well, yeah, they just go. No, they, they just said, yeah, it's not. We don't think it's for us, and, and you know maybe you know maybe it's time to to move on. And so I thought, and for wow. a minute I thought, yeah, God, maybe it's maybe maybe I have run out of things that, to say that resonate with people. But I thought I've never been that wrong before. You know, I always write the mm. book I wish I'd had when yeah. I was going through something. And and also I looked at all the books that were being written about women my age and they were normally like a neat book the books where, you know, that the woman melts away with loneliness and she eventually dies in a lonely flat and gets eaten by her cats. Yeah. And I looked at my women friends and I thought, I don't know anyone like that. All my women friends are swinging off a chandelier with a toy boy between their teeth. <laughs> You know, they're I'm coming around yours. <laughs> Anytime, Sam, you're so welcome. You know, they're climbing Everest. They're going up the Amazon. They're, they're having adventures, like adventure mm. before dementia is a really, is like a motto for them. You know, we've got such an amazingly broad hinterland because we've, we've done That's everything. Thing, isn't it? We've raised the babies. We've had the heartbreaks. We've had the divorces. We've had the love affairs. We've had the promotions. We've had the setbacks. We've had the... We've looked after our aged parents. We've raised kids. We've we've done so much and achieved so much. We have so much to say. So I thought, you're wrong. So mm. I dumped my agent and I went, I got an agent who's a gay guy who immediately got what I was talking about mm. and got me a two-book deal with with the um, head of Zeus Bloomsbury in about half an hour. So I thought, you know, I'm so glad I didn't just wilt like a bit of lettuce in the corner of the room. Yeah. Women at our age tend to think, oh, tend to sort of go too quietly, never complain, never yeah. complain. Complain! Yeah, you know, well, be it, loud! I mean, it's happened. You see it happen so much to women in their kind of mid-late 50s, just go, oh, you know. And a lesser woman than you might go and think, oh, they're right, I'm not going to get another book deal. All the book deals are going to kind of... Young, cool are. women under 30. Well, and, you know, who buys books? I'll tell you who buys books. Women our age. Yeah, and exactly. A lot of the publishing, the men in the publishing industry dis- dismiss women our age as Karens, they call us, you know, Karens. Yeah. That when they make jokes about how how um, insipid and, and dull we are, like as though we sit around knitting our own orgasms and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> you so, mean you don't? Oh, <laughs> Well, actually, afternoon is yet young. <laughs> um, no, the only thing I knit are my eyebrows. Uh, but um, anyway, so and of course, so I wrote 
I wrote this book so fast. I was so angry. I, yeah. In one year, I wrote it, edited it, recorded it, published it, and promoted it. It went straight to number one in Australia. And it's been on the best sellers for seven weeks, and it's just about to come out here. And the t- and the review so far, the reviews I've got so far have been fabulous, but the one I got here just recently was a tonic for our times. And I thought, you know what? Women really want to hear this, yeah. and they want to feel a bit empowered to, yeah. to fight back. And, and, of course, the great thing about being female is that we have that wonderful female camaraderie. We have That's that female thing, friendship. Isn't it? And you know, Sam, I always say women are each other's human wonder bras. You do. Yeah. <laughs> make each other look bigger and better. But it's absolutely true. I'd be totally flat without my female friends. And also I have three sensational sisters. And I think as you get older, I think women's friendships are, are not just vitally important because, you know, divorce, silver divorce, silver divorces are the highest divorce rate. They really are, aren't they? I mean, that's the the thing I was going to ask you is that they, I wrote a piece for The Shift about the fact that all of my friends, not every single one, but a lot, are leaving their husbands. Yeah. And, you know, and these are not necessarily terrible marriages. They're just like, do you know what? I'm 48, 55, 62. I want more and I don't want it to involve cooking tea for someone else anymore so you left your husband didn't you were you in your late 50s yes yes I was I was in my late 50s yeah and I've got to say to anyone listening I don't anyone who's going through this or they're contemplating this I don't see divorce as a failure I see it as a change and change is is a good thing you know, and you can still salvage a friendship no matter what because you've got to always remember there's something about that person you loved and there's mm. something in you that they loved. So you have to focus. Once you get through the, the, the horror of the divorce and separating all the finances, and everything, which is terrible, you just have to keep saying to it to yourself, nobody will die and it will end, and, yeah. and it does. <laughs> you know, you can salvage a friendship for sure, especially if you have children. I think that's really important to concentrate on on the positive side. But is it any wonder people want to, women want a second act? I mean, we live for so long now. You know, once upon a time, everyone was dead at like 28, 32. <laughs> what yeah. did it matter? But now from honeymoon to tomb can be 80 years. Yeah, that's, that's a, a long, long time, isn't time it? time to find someone's anecdotes interesting or for them to find yeah. your anecdotes interesting. <laughs> and the other thing I think is interesting, so fascinating about the fact that it's women who are initiating divorces. The chief time women initiate the divorce is when the husband retires because we want di- we want different things. And mm. first of all, in evolutionary terms, menopause is a new factor because, as I said earlier, everyone was long dead before we got to this age. And where society is still getting used to this idea of women having a, a second act, but just as our estrogen goes down and our testosterone comes up, with men the opposite happens: their testosterone drops and their estrogen comes up. So when a man retires, generally speaking, he wants to stay at home and nest. Mm, yeah. And women are like, oh, I've nested. You know, I've done I've, that. Let me out. I've, yeah. I've, I've, I've butted 4,000 acres of toast. You know, I've, I've roasted 4 million flocks of chickens. I, I want to go out and take on the world and like, while I'm physically fit and explore and have adventures and everything. So there's a real dichotomy in what couples want. And, and we know that marriage suits men much more than women. Married men live longer than single men, have less heart disease and mental problems, whereas single women live longer mm. than married women, have less heart disease and mental problems. So unless men pull up their psychological socks, they're going to find themselves put out with the recycling and it won't be good for their health. Men need to step up for sure. What was it like for you being back out there in your late 50s? Well, it's a terrifying notion, isn't it? And it's not yeah. as though you're really looking for a man. You 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 leave because you you just you're not you know you just not feel you're not getting the emotional sustenance that that you need. My my ex husband's I mean, he's a brilliant lawyer, and he worked very very hard. I mean, I suffered from subpoena envy, really. Like, yeah. Another pun, Sam. Another pun. Yeah. I suffered from subpoena envy and it was, and it, you know, we were kind of just and ended up leading separate lives, individuating. And I think men only leave if there's another woman, but women leave for themselves. Yes, that's so true. They and do. people always think there must be someone else. 
yeah. don't they? They always think you must be having an affair. Yeah, and no, no. In my in my experience, from all my friends, and also when I'm on book tour, I meet the most wonderful women. I mean, I'm so flattered. My women readers are just and and when it, I've just got back from this long tour in Australia, and I did a one woman show in England here, so good girls night out. I went all around Britain meeting the most fabulous women. And they're, they're just, they're warm, witty, wise. They bring me up little anecdotes they've saved up for me, something funny that happens and that they think I might use. I just want to go on a, go on a girl's night out with all of them. I mean, what's not to love about middle-aged women? So fabulous. <laughs> do you find that they've been with you since the beginning? I mean, because yes, I, I definitely, Girls' Night Out was the first one of yours I read. and then That's Lana when we Parler, met. And then, yes, yes, yes. And we, neither of us have changed, obviously, Sam. Not the tiniest bit. Not one iota. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, that's right. They have come along with me on the trip, on the journey. Because as I said to you earlier, I I always try and write the book I wish I'd had when I was going through something. So I go through it. I do all the suffering. (laughs) Mm. Then I try and find the funny. I find what's funny about it. And then I try and write it in a way that's uplifting and entertaining, but also poignant. You know, you have to have the the, the grit with the wit. (laughs) And, and just as a kind of coping mechanism, just you know, just help other other women because I'm so passionate about the sisterhood get through the really rocky paths of their lives. So yeah, they have grown up with me, and I only write because it's cheaper than therapy. Yeah. So I've really written about everything that's ever ever happened to me, <laughs> and it's worked, hasn't it? I mean, if you think about it. You know, Mad Cows was such a about motherhood, such a massive success, and fetal yeah. attraction, and and on and on. So the idea that you would take your book to your agent and go, actually, I want to write a book about how women in mid, middle aged women are totally fucking sick of it, and he yes. would kind of go, oh, Kathy, you know, you don't really know what you know, you don't know. I know it was so shocking. And and I, I think women in all walks of life are going through that. So in the totally, revenge, yeah. in the revenge club, um, at, the, the, there's as you know four different women. The setup of the book: there's four women who are at university together. Uh, they they haven't seen each other since university, so they had a falling out of some kind. We don't really know why yet. But one of them ha- moved to America to work in special effects movies. She's coming back to London. She contacts them it's thirty years later to say, "Let's get together." So they're a bit trepidatious, but three of them arrive first and they, like women do, pick up where they left off, mm-hmm. laughing, cackling like kookaburras, having a fantastic time. And they're waiting for Joe, the one from America. And then this man comes and sits at their table and they're like, um, I'm sorry, you can't sit there. We're, we're waiting for our friend. And he's like, yeah, I know. You're waiting for Joe Logan. And they're like, well, how do you know that? And she's like, he's like, well, I'm Joe. And first of all, they think, oh, my God, is our friend transition. But then she explains that she, the company she was working for in Hollywood sacked her for the crime of being a menopausal hot mess. Mm. But as a hoax, she went home and just ter- transi- turned herself into, transformed into a man, as kind of just as a, as a revenge trick, went back to the same company, didn't just get a job there, got a pay rise and a promotion. And she thinks, you know what, in a man's world, it's just so much easier to be a man. And her three friends are horrified. They're like, you're so wrong. There's never been a better time yeah. to be a woman. And then that week something cataclysmic happens to each of them in their career and, and their personal lives where they're punished for being over 50. And when they meet the next week, they're like, you're so right. And that's when they form the Revenge Club. But, of course, they've now got a secret weapon because Joe can get into the men's room and that's when the diabolical fun begins. And the characters, so we've got Joe as special effects. Penny is a, a news, she's a reporter and she has her own daytime television show and she thinks she's she's moving into the nighttime shift with her male co-anchor. But, of course, they take the mail and they dump her mm. because she put a picture of herself on Instagram with a bit of grey hair and no makeup. I mean, how dare she? So she's mm. Simon. Now, Meanwhile, he's happen- Silver Fox, yeah. But we see this happen every day, women exactly, of yeah. certain age, even at the BBC. We're paying half the licence fee. I want to <laughs> see women who look like me, but they're, they're sidelined. And then the other one is an actress who gave up her big career to raise her kids and now she's the empty nest. She's ready to go back into the, into the acting stratosphere. And, of course, the only jobs she's offered is um, an ad for um, vaginal dryness. And, what um, else? Tanner, maybe. Yeah. yeah, that's right. And an incontinence pad ad, you know? Yeah. 
And then um, who's my who's my next character? You. I mean, Matilda. Oh, the writer. Oh, yeah. Of course, I left myself out. And then I <laughs> used all I used all everything that happened to me, the sexism that I face in the publishing world. I I used that because I could draw on that so you know so easily. Mm. So um, and what she does when her book is rejected, she then they, she then just re submits it under a male name. And, and Joe pretends to be the author. Of course, it becomes a huge bestseller. <laughs> so <laughs> wishful thinking, Sam, wishful yeah, thinking. Yeah, <laughs> I have always wanted to do that, though, haven't you? I've just always wanted to see what would happen. Totally, because, I mean, I hate the term chick lit, you know. Oh, men who, God. Men, uh, men who write first-person funny fiction, they get compared to Chekhov, and we get chick off. Yeah. We get, a pink, okay. we get a pink cover with a cupcake on it. Yeah. And you're like, really? It's so infuriating. And there's a line in the book where she's trying to think of a, a genre to describe what she's what she's writing now. Because in a way, even though I hate the term, I think my books did kick start I, the idea of chick lit in the 80s yeah. and 90s. Mummy lit, because no one had written a book like Mad Cows when that came out, taking the idea that motherhood's the ultimate um, fulfilment for a female and whacking that big sacred cow on the old Barbie, uh, and Niplet writing about cosmetic surgery. And I thought, well, what's the new genre for this time of our life? And the character in the book comes up with the idea of, I don't give a shit, Nip. Yeah. <laughs> I'm here that. for it. I'm here for yeah, it. Exactly. <laughs> hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda, you never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. I just kind of keep thinking a bit conspiracy theory in my head when you're talking, because it's like we're presented with like these two ways of aging, which is either pretend not to be or go quietly into like little old lady with glasses and gray hair over there and don't bother anybody. But I mean, I'm, I'm 57 now and I love it. I yeah. love yes. being out the other side of that and I've never I've never I don't think I've ever felt so comfortable in myself as I do now and there's a little bit of me that thinks mm, somebody up there knows that and they want to make sure that we don't find that out that's right well we're letting the letting that that particular cat out of that particular bag right now it's what we want everyone to know is that with the, despite what what the terrible sexism we endure I mean a man once said to me not long ago I put think I put that line in the book where he said Older women are like Mogadishu. We know it exists, but we don't want to go there. Well, maybe Mogadishu wouldn't let you in. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so that's what we have to fight fight against. And a bit big part of the problem is that we never see ourselves. You know, eighty five percent of exactly. people on British television over fifty are men. Eighty five percent, and they can have as many wrinkles and crinkles as they like. But the women, we know there's all these cases going on at the BBC where middle-aged women are suing for sexism mm. because they've been they've been discarded. So we need to really make sure, especially on on the BBC, which as I said, we pay for, that we see ourselves and that we and that we see other women who haven't had all the cosmetic surgery, who just look vivacious and interesting with their whole history on their face. You know, we just need more visibility. So um, and there's a there's a lot of campaigns to, you know, to to try and get older women cast more often in mm. in TV shows etc. Ones who haven't had all that all that fakery because you know whenever you're a, there's a middle aged woman on a TV sh- TV sort of detective series, she's you, you know you can't walk through a forest without stubbing your toe on the corpse of some old middle aged woman who needed her comeuppance or was or was the gossip mm. they naggy or gossipy or whatever. So we're always the victims and we're never the, the protagonists and the heroines. I mean, very, very occasionally, like Happy Valley was a wonderful example of having a brilliant um, older woman as driving the narrative and driving the plot and, and um, 
you know, taking all the focus and attention. So we just need a lot more of that. So Yeah, because it's always like that sense, isn't there, that, well, we've got one, you know, yeah, we've done that. We've done the... Oh, we've done one, yeah. We've done the older woman, so, you know. Yeah. It's like when they have one token woman on a, on one of those comedy panel shows. I always think we're up shit creek without a panel. Sorry, pun, <laughs> yeah. pun creek. <laughs> but the, I, the day we've know we've got true equality, where the host is female, all the guests, the comics are female, and there's one token bloke, then we can go. Okay, we've we've made progress. I mean, I think the Me Too movement has helped. I think those top order predators, they're still there, but they've kind of crawled under the rock, you know. And they yeah, are, keeping a low profile just for now. But women's rights are slipping mm. back. World, so we have to be. Look what's happening in America. Yeah, I mean, like he's probably going to get voted back in and it's just like and what's happened with Roe versus Wade and but see I think the only way it's going to change I've been a feminist since I wrote my first book at 17 a vocal an advocate for equality but nothing has it hasn't still hasn't changed we still don't have equal pay we're getting about what 75 pence in the pound and it's not going to change until men join us at the barricades which they that's haven't that's the thing isn't it you know, and men always say to me, oh, you know, you feminists want so much. I'm like, do we? What do we want? We want equal pay. No, we pay. just want the same. What does say? Well, we'd like equal pay. We'd like men to work out that mutual orgasm is not an insurance company. <laughs> Boom. Right? Boom. We'd like them to um, help more around the house, which um, I, I wrote a book called How to Kill Your Husband and Other Handy Household Hints. <laughs> and there was, a, there was a line in there where she said, um, it was in men's interest to help around the house because it was scientifically proven that no woman ever shot her husband while he was vacuuming. But that's actually true. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and we want them to be better in the kitchen because I think, you know, the greatest aphrodisiac for me is a, is a man in a cooking apron. <laughs> what, what, what You've women, got one now, haven't you? Have, and, you know, what do women really want in bed? Breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> And a really good book. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I'm going to ask, uh, move to the questions I always ask in a minute, but I just want to ask you one more thing. In the book, there's kind of what I like to think of is like the ultimate midlife mantra. If you if something no longer sparks joy, toss it away. That's right. Including what us, have yes. you tossed away? <laughs> well, I did leave my marriage because I was not having joy sparked there. And, and neither was he, to be fair. I mean, you know. It was. A, I just called time on it before he did. But so, yeah, definitely that. Yeah, that's the Marie Kondo emotional mm. <laughs> cleansing. <laughs> um, what else have I cast away? I, I've cast away too much worry and anxiety about, uh, you know, how, what people think of me and and how my life's going. I'm just like just trying to like absolutely love every every day of it and and live big and live wild. I mean, I've got a a column in the Sunday Times now, a travel column, once a week, and I do get to just ricochet around the globe having oh, adventures, fantastic. trying out things with my female readers, and that's been great fun. I couldn't have done that. Um, I couldn't have done that when I when my kids were younger, and you know, the, even though I say it's great for women to cut the psychological umbilical cord, I do have an autistic son, so mm. I can never completely, you know, sever that. So I have to be around for him as much as as much as I can. And that that will always be the case. And for any any mother who's raising a child with special needs, I mean, my heart goes out to you because it's so hard. It's like raising a hundred kids in one. It's really a tough, tough call. And they're they're all super women in my view. And they're mainly women because the men do leave usually. Mm. I mean, there's, there's mm. a, Often, yeah. Yeah, divorce rates are really high when there's a special needs child, and um, and so are mental health issues, of course, because it's it's so it's so tough. But it can be rewarding. Like my own son, Jules is great. He's like Wikipedia with a pulse. Yeah. He can roar with laughter because he has no filter and says whatever he's thinking, <laughs> which you know can be can be socially a tad awkward sometimes. Yeah. When, he was, when he was fourteen, I took him to Downing Street to meet the then Prime Minister Tony Blair, and I said, "Oh, Jules, this is." This is the Prime Minister, Tony Blair. And Jules said to him, oh, yes, you're the one my mother calls, Tony, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going, <laughs> <laughs> you know, the mouth from the south, I couldn't think of anything to say. <laughs> oh, God, that's a first. I know, right? So, but anyway, I just, the other thing, other worries I, I tried to let go. 
So and that's that's don't sweat the small stuff, as Nora Ephron used to say. You know, women have so much minutiae in our life to deal with, but you know, just don't angst over dusty skirting boards and whatever. Just no. Questions I always ask: What is your emotional age? Um, <laughs> definitely teenage. I mean, I'm I'm like a teenager, but with wrinkles instead of pimples. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I say the wrong thing. I party too hard. I never say no. You know, I can't turn down an adventure. <laughs> yeah. So I think, yeah, definitely teenage. I'd say probably about 17, 18. <laughs> you have, were, were you really happy at 17, 18? Oh, no, not really. I was I was a surfy girl. I mean, the boys I grew up with, the first novel I wrote was about yeah. the initiation of these young women into the surfy culture. The guys were so sexist. They used to get us to cut their names out in paper, sticky tape them to our stomachs, then <sighs> sunbake. So we get a tan tattoo in the shape of their names. Ugh. So if ever I have cancer, I will have this melanoma called Bruce. <laughs> I have to have like a brucectomy. But what I did have was great girlfriends, which I still have. So mm. and I, when I when I see my girlfriends, we're still dancing around the kitchen and carrying on like idiots and drinking too many cocktails. So you know that I haven't really I haven't really changed yeah. from that time. <laughs> yeah. Give us a book recommendation. Well, my, one of my favourite books is actually written by a man, even though the protagonist is one of the best female creations ever, Vanity Fair, Becky Sharp. I mean, she was the Madonna of her day, like just flaunting traditions and social mores and, and being selfish and putting herself first, you know. Mm-hmm. And and she gets so criticised because she was um, a social climber. She kind of climbed the ladder lad by lad kind of thing. Yeah. But if you only think back to what it, what was it, was available to women at the time, you could be a governess or a, or a but that was probably it, a governess or a domestic servant. Mm. Um, or married. When, wedlock, and wedlock was a little more than a padlock. As soon as you got mm. married, everything you owned was went into his name, you know, or, or you could be a prostitute and marriage and prostitution was practically a tautology in those mm. days. So she's, I can't believe she's written by a man because she's so believable and she's so fabulously flawed and so fierce and so resilient and so so unapologetic. That's what I love about her. So, um, yeah, I think Becky Sharp is a character every woman needs to discover and perhaps take a few, take a few life lessons <laughs> from her trajectory. <laughs> what advice would you give younger women? Oh, I would say um, always stand on your own two stilettos and never wait to be rescued by a knight in shining Armani. <laughs> and wear sunblock. Wear sunblock. <laughs> you, can join, you can play Join the Dots with my sunspots. And what they would say is, you should have worn sunblock, you idiot. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Who's your old bird role model? Gosh. Well, of course, there's so many I adore. But I'd probably have to say I think Joan Rivers. Because she absolutely broke the mould comedically. She opened the door for every other female comic. There had never been anyone like her, except perhaps Mae West, who's another fabulous old bird role model. Um, and and they could lacerate people with one-liners because, yes, men are physically stronger, but women are more verbally dexterous. We use, on average, about 400 more words in our daily vocabulary. And when I give talks in schools to young women, I always say to them, when you go out at night, you're underdressed unless you've got a couple of great one-liners tucked up your trouser <laughs> leg. Because if a man is belittling you and putting you down in any way, if you can give a quick bit of a quick bit of quiplash and make a joke at his expense and get other people to laugh at him, you've completely taken away his power. Whether it's in the workplace or whether it's out at, you know, in a pub or whatever, you've a quick tongue lashing. I call it the black belt in tongue foo. And that's what women have to develop. And Joan Rivers was, oh my gosh, she was the ma- the mistress of that. And Mae West, you know, two, two iconic, funny, fabulous females. And Dorothy Parker, you know, all of them. <laughs> yes. So just channel, channel the mm-hmm. fabulous funny. What's your superpower? Well, at the moment, it is my cloak of invisibility that that I've been handed by society that means I can make a lot more mischief and get away with a lot more. 
and and I'm using that cloak of invisibility to make to for evil. And I would recommend okay. every other woman yeah. our age to go out there and make wreak havoc, you know, yeah. and just see what you can get away with. <laughs> Because also you can get away with a lot more because people just go, oh, they think, oh, you know, she's 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 past it. <laughs> Let yes, she may have just said something outrageous, but you know she, she can't help it. And I I just <laughs> use that to my advantage at all times. But I've always done that, even because I'm Australian living in England. You can get away with a lot more because people can't categorise you. You know, they did. Whereas all my English friends, as soon as someone speaks, they know where they went to school, what sort of breakfast they have, what their sexual proclivity is, what they read. Mm. But people have to be nice to me just in case I'm Rupert Murdoch's daughter or something. (laughs) It means it gives me great social mobility. I'm Vaseline coated. I can go from Arvo tea at at Buck House to, you know, a beer with the single mums in the council flat with absolute ease. So I've always had a bit of that, but especially now that I'm older. And don't you find, Sam, I don't know if this happens to you, because we're talking about this great liberating thing about when you're getting older and not caring what people think. Sometimes I'm thinking something and then I actually you know, yeah. come out of my mouth. Like if someone drops something on the street, was normally I'd think, oh, gosh, it's not my place to tell them to pick it up or they might have a gun or a knife or something. I'm thinking, oh, you lowly worm, how could you drop that? <laughs> and, then I, and then I think, oh, I just said that out loud. Yeah. <laughs> but then I actually get a bit scared when you do. You yeah. know, that well, thinking. that just reminds me of something Helen Garner said to me because, you know, she was saying that about how waiters and how nobody looks at you. You know, that kind of not just that, not the male gaze thing, but totally just the eye contact thing. And she said, you know, sometimes she just says eye contact and they're like, mm. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, I am still here. That's yeah. right. And that's why I think we need to be loud, loud, proud, big, bold, claim the space, you know, just be visible, refuse to be put out to pasture. Um, and, and that, yeah, and, and you, it does empower you when you're out with your girlfriends that you can you can give each other that that uh, comedic camaraderie, you know. So, yeah, I just just look forward to it as being actually the best time of a woman's life and just go kicking and screaming. And last one, how many fucks do you give? <laughs> what, to my boyfriend every day? Oh, at least, <laughs> at least four, maybe five. <laughs> <laughs> How many fucks? Do I, well, I do. I really passionately care and give a fuck about feminine, feminism and trying to make the world a fairer place for women. And I am so um, uh, furious that we haven't achieved what what we should have by now. So, and and I'm just getting angry and angry about that. But in a caustic, hopefully witty way, because I think if you can disarm with charm and make people laugh you're much more likely to bring them along on your journey. So that's why my books, especially this new one, I think you'll agree it's pretty fiercely feminist. Yes. But, it, but it's also full of laughter and love. And that's the, that's the balance that I like. But I, I, do give a, I do give a big fuck about that. Yeah, Women's rights, always have, always will. Thank you for listening. If you enjoy The Shift and would like to show your appreciation, why not buy me a coffee? Go to www.buymeacoffee.com forward slash The Shift with Sam Baker. You can hear a new episode of The Shift every Tuesday, wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like what you hear, please do rate, review, follow, tell your friends, because it really does help other people find us. And if you'd like to know more about my own experience of shifting, my book, The Shift, How I Lost and Found Myself After 40, and You Can Too, is out now in paperback.